Thank you very much for coming along tonight. My name is Andrew Carr and I'm with the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. And tonight we're going to have uh, hopefully an informal chat. Certainly we're looking forward to hearing your views. As this is a topic that is inspired by both recent scholarship, coming books from scholars, but also a sense that we need to return to some of the larger debates about Australian foreign policy. That there is often a bit of an absence of discussion on Australian foreign policy topics at the moment, and yet there do seem echoes with previous decades where there was a lot more attention to these issues. There do seem echoes with some of the tension, some of the rapid periods of change, some of the questions about capacity of leadership that we saw in the 1970s. And for us here at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, we've been starting to wonder, are we starting to see, to some degree, echoes to today? And of course, with all the implications that that might imply for changes and evolution in the way that Australia thinks about itself in the world and the way that it develops its policy and tries to implement it. Tonight, I've brought together two scholars who I'm going to ask a couple of questions about and then open for you to have a chance to engage with. They are Dr. James Curran, Associate Professor at the University of Sydney. He's just written a fantastic new book that's been getting excellent reviews, Unholy Fury, Whitlam and Nixon at War. This indeed was a book that was being advertised and promoted well before he had written it. Such was <laughs> the interest in some of the material and, and kind of attention to, this, to his scholarship. Previous work by Dr. Curran includes Power of Speech on Australian Prime Minister's development of a kind of national narrative, search for identity after the end of the British Empire, and Curtin's Empire on the way that uh, John Curtin's views about the Commonwealth and emerging roles of the uh, Dominions. I've also asked to come along tonight Dr. John Blaxland, a, a Senior Research Fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. Dr. Blaxland hopefully is well known to many of you. He is, the co he is the author of the second volume of the official history of the Australian Secret Intelligence Organisation's official history called The Protest Years and a co-author of the third vo volume. This year he's also releasing an edited book on the East Timor intervention and he has a long list of scholarship on projects such as from the Australian Army from Whitlam to Howard and Strategic Cousins on Australia and Canada. So these are our, our two speakers tonight and we'll talk for about 45 minutes or so to an hour and then give you plenty of time to engage. So James, to start off our, our talk tonight, we often think of the 1970s as kind of the years of turmoil and change, but a lot of your book is actually about the 1960s and the effect that that had. Why was that such a significant decade for setting up what happened in the 1970s? Okay, well I think in the, in the 60s, I mean to quote uh, Donald Horne in the mid 60s talked about the loss of Australia's assured strategic imagination. And uh, what he was referring to there were some of these incredibly, what I would call seismic shocks to Australia's sense of security and, uh, and its outlook on the world. And the first one of those was in the early 1960s was the British government's attempt to join the European economic community. And of course, de Gaulle, French president might have said no, might have vetoed that in 63, but nevertheless, you know, Robert Menzies referred to that decision by the British government as the most important in peacetime in my lifetime, he said. Words such as unimaginable, were frequently used by Australian ministers in talking about this British ambition because of course it would mean a fundamental new appraisal of Australia's role in the world and Australia would have to find new markets for its products. So it was going to have to deal with Asia and, and Asian cultures in a new way. So there, there was a permanency about that decision even though, even though as I said it was vetoed by de Gaulle. The Australians knew there would be no turning back that the, the old world where the cultural attachment to the British Isles and the economic interests where they had converged, this was a moment of uh, irreversible divergence. So the economic foundation of the Anglo-Australian relationship from that moment was changed. John Crawford, the great economist and public servant said, our psychology has changed in the wake of that British application. Mm. Rupert Murdoch's The Australian was launched in 1964. Its very first editorial the headline of it was facing up to the challenge of adulthood. And it said, if one decision has brought home to us the fact that we're now alone, 
It's Britain's decision to, to try and join the EEC. It's a salutary shock. Now, the second one, of course, was the British government's decision in the mid-60s to start talking about withdrawing the military, the British military from east of Suez. In other words, you know, the global pressures of decolonisation were putting all sorts of uh, uh, pressure on the assumptions of European imperialism. Britain could no longer sustain its world role. Couldn't afford it. Had a balance of payments problem. Um, and so it was looking to retract its military presence from east of Suez. And then thirdly, in 1969, now that decision on the east of Suez was speeded up. Uh, the announcement to speed it up was made in 67. Um, but then in 69, in July of 1969, uh, you had the announcement by the Nixon administration of its Guam, subsequently enabled as the Nixon Doctrine, which talked about a different American posture in Asia. And Keith Waller, <clears throat> who just had come back from Washington early 1970, I think, as uh, Australia's ambassador to Washington, wrote a paper for <coughs> foreign affairs, external affairs as it was still then, and said, this threatens <coughs> an American withdrawal from the whole area west of Hawaii. So in other words, just to sum up, at the beginning of the decade, you had almost a situation of nirvana for Australian politicians and policy makers. They had both their great and powerful friends engaged in the region. By the end of it, you had serious concerns about whether Britain would stay, and the Australians were appealing all the time to Britain's sense of its world role. It wasn't getting Holt or Gorton anywhere. And also this sense that the American posture in Asia was changing. In other words, by the end of the decade, which I think sets the scene for the 1970s, the Australians were facing nothing less than the collapse of their Cold War policy. That is, keeping the Americans and the British engaged in Southeast Asia. Mm. John, you've written quite a bit about this period. Were these, is it, is it fair to depict Australia as being kind of completely buffeted by international winds, or do you see some of the, the changes also kind of coming from home as well? Um, they are coming from home, but they are buffeted. It's, it's a bit of both, really. Um, it's interesting, you know, James <coughs> made the point there about feeling, I, I, get a, I guess, a sense of abandonment mm. from America and Britain. But it's also a time when, uh, Australia is emerging into a remarkably prosperous and benign uh, strategic and economic uh, set of circumstances that uh, we're seeing the relationship with Japan uh, pro uh, flourish and uh, Korea really start to take off. We've established diplomatic relations with China, uh, you know, a few years before and we're trading with China. Uh, and so there's a, there's a whole range of factors there. We're, we're also uh, looking at um, we, we, just last year we celebrated 40 years of ties with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So there was a significant engagement in a new way in the region uh, that was facilitated by the fact that while the Americans you know, had talked about the Guam Doctrine and uh, withdrawing out of continental Asia, they, the work that had happened, the, the events that had transpired, meant that the circumstances had changed dramatically and had allowed ASEAN itself to form and it allowed Japan to prosper it allowed us to engage in a way that we hadn't previously. So uh, the dynamics, uh, you know, domestically, uh, there was, you know, significant change afoot as well, of course, because of the migration. And it's very interesting, and this is something that will come out in, in my book uh, later on next, uh, next month. Um, migration has a significant effect. It's not just from the British Isles anymore. Uh, we're getting significant uh, migration from southern Europe. And of course, uh, that, that's particularly the case in the, in the 50s through to the 70s. And of course, afterwards, we get a different change from uh, with the Vietnamese uh, uh, wave of migration later, which changes the face of migration yet again. But those dynamics are, are contributing to a, a change of uh, Australia's own identity. You know, uh, James talks about this, this concern about uh, not, not having the British ties. And, and I remember as a child, my first passport was on my mother's passport was a British subject on it. Uh, mm. uh, and of course, uh, there was a strong sense of identity for most people that we were British, a sense of still being British. And yet a growing proportion of the population didn't identify with Britain very much at all, except for the fact that English was the language and uh, Britain's laws had, had you know, uh, effectively been uh, transplanted here. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's two sides to it, you're right. And James, we all remember Whitlam as kind of, well at least some of us remember Whitlam, as embodying this kind of sense of the need for change. Mm. How much was that about um, Whitlam's own kind of personality and how much of it was about um, 
any leader in those kind of circumstances would have let it through and you know the, the change was inevitable in some ways. Yeah, I, I think Whitlam would even have admitted, and I think he did admit in some public speeches, that he was riding, riding the tide of great events, not swimming against them. And I think what he's talking about there is there was a sense that the, it was the end of the vir virtual end of the Cold War in East Asia. And, uh, and there was a sense that the rigid bipolarity of the Cold War had at least been substantially qualified. Now, of mm. course, mm. the Americans and the Soviet Union st still retained a nuclear arsenal and could, it could um, annihilate each other. Um, but there was more of a sense that a, an emerging multipolarity gave Australia more freedom of action. Mm. So, I mean, in this period, you know, you have the European community establishing themselves, obviously, as a more substantial economic presence. The rise of Germany and Japan is continuing apace. The Third World are asserting themselves uh, in the UN as a powerful voting bloc. You have the OPEC countries. I mean, even Richard Nixon is talking a new language for an American president at this time. He's saying it's a good thing if America is not the predominant power in the world, rather if there is a kind of a balance of power. Uh, so it was classic real politic from Nixon at this time. Um, he's also warning of American decline. So <clears throat> Whitlam does, Whitlam is the beneficiary, I think, of these significantly changing circumstances. Um, but he also gives, I, I think, I think Whitlam was needed to give a dramatic manifestation of how Australia was to reorient itself in those new circumstances. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously the words that are most often quoted to embody this change was the first statement that Whitlam gave uh, as Prime Minister on the 5th of December 1972 about foreign policy. And he said it would be more independent, less racist, less military oriented. Uh, and so, but Whitlam, as I said, he also, he also admitted that he was, as I said, giving dramatic effect to a lot of changes that had already taken place before. And I think he was, in his own way, giving some credit for all the, for all the muddle-headedness, if you like, and the anxiousness and the kind of um, restless search for some kind of answer to these new circumstances that was pursued by Holt, Gordon and McMahon. And you can virtually mm. see them mm. in their public rhetoric. They're actually thinking it through aloud. Gordon is saying, God, we can't look to the British Navy anymore, um, so we've got to look to American protection, but that's not sure. But Gordon is the one who actually says, Britain is a foreign country for Australia. Mm. And he tells this to Alexander Downer Sr. when he arrives in London in 1969 for the Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference. Well, Downer Sr. is aghast. I think he nearly has a heart attack in the embassy car on the way to the Savoy and rests back and says, Hyde Park, Kensington Palace, this is not a foreign country to me. Mm. But mm. nevertheless, you know, Gorton, to a lesser extent McMahon, had started some of these changes. Whitlam comes in, I think, and he's unburdened by the failed policies of the past. He has a fresh mind, he has a powerful personality, and he gives shape to it. And he's the one who gives a policy face mm. to some of these changes. I mean, the British High Commissioner in Australia at that time, Maurice James, said that Whitlam suffered what he felt was the presentational itch. <laughs> now, uh, that's, not, that's not underplaying some of the changes that Whitlam brought in at all, because they were substantial and they were very much required. Um, but but uh, he felt that Whitlam's idea of bringing a new maturity to the relationship with the United States, mm. to getting rid of what he called colonial relics and the constitutional anachronisms with the British government, so royal style and titles, rights of appeal to the Privy Council, um, uh, the new national anthem. These were all meant to update Australia's relationship with Britain and bring it more into line with the circumstances. So that would be my answer to that. <laughs> Staying with Whitlam for the moment, Coral Bell places him in the school or the kind of part of the Labor Party that it has always been very attracted to America, that has seen America as perhaps a more natural model for Australia compared to the United Kingdom, mm. you know, and less class based, more open, more vibrant mm. society. Would you agree with that notion that Whitlam was actually very sympathetic to the Americans? And, and can we separate his personal views of America and Americans from mm. the clash and, and kind of struggles that he had during his time as Prime Minister? 
I think so. I think I would broadly agree with that. Um, that is to say that Whitlam often did profess his admiration for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, mm. um, for I think the America of civil rights uh, in the, in the 60s. I mean, I think this was a so this was this was a different America that Whitlam was ennobling and holding up um, to the one that conservatives in Australia were, but it was America nonetheless. Um, he didn't ever indulge in the kind of anti-American homilies. Um, I think there was a famous quip that uh, uh, Arthur Caldwell said to Tom Uren, you know, for God's sake, Tom, I'm not going to let you bastards destroy the US alliance. I think Whitlam would agree with that. Um, he spent a lot of time, uh, especially as opposition leader, but from as early as 1964, I think, when he and Malcolm Fraser, intriguingly enough, were both in the United States on one of these leaders' grants, mm. where they went over for a couple of months to meet with top American officials and academics uh, and learn more about what was going on in America and the American political system. Uh, and from, from that moment, I mean, he builds up a very substantial relationship with key officials in the Department of State. For example, he meets Marshall Green in 1964 and says, I don't think there's great coherence to American foreign policy in Asia. How are you going to put all the pieces together? Mm. Um, the Americans still look at Whitlam right through this period as someone who's a moderate, who can keep the left wing of the party in check, who's not going to give in to what they see as some of the rat bags, in their view, uh, on the left of the party who are threatening the bases. Whitlam's uncomfortable with the bases. There's no doubt about that, sorry, with the intelligence installations. Um, but no, I think, broadly speaking, you know, he continue, continually talks about America as the most generous and idealistic nation. Mm. He talks about the influence of the Declaration of Independence and mm. what connects the French and American revolutions. I mean, Whitlam, as you, as you all know, had that mm. great historical knowledge. I mean, he could connect all those, all those dots. Um, and as his, rise, his political rise continued throughout the 60s and as he was headed to office, it became more and more important for him to protect his alliance flank. And so that's when you do see a kind of a, a kind of a surge in this language about American idealism and the fact that, that the conservative policy in supporting the United States in Vietnam is actually holding the Americans back from being the rightful and true leader of the free world. That's the language he uses. Um, now then, on the other hand, of course, after the Tet Offensive, he can then start to talk about Vietnam as the war of the great lie and start to damn American policy in much more forceful terms. But whilst ever he's keeping that other language and that other imagery of America there, I think it reassures, reassures the Americans. So, yeah, broadly speaking, I think you can separate the clash with Nixon uh, from his uh, affection for America and American ideals. Mm. Mm. And John, Whitlam in some ways was kind of tapping into that public anger, which, I mean, you've titled the um, next volume of the ASIO official history, The Protest Years. How significant was that a public engagement on, on these issues in terms of driving these debates and, and shaping the country's approach? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, the, the, year, the years were ones of protest. There's so much to protest at the time. Um, you know, we had the baby boomer generation that was coming of age in the, in the, in the 1960s and through the 70s that was uh, viewing the world in a different way. Uh, there was phenomenon hap happening overseas, the, 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 uh, the international, the, 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 the uprisings in, in, in the, the protests in the United States, the uprisings in Paris. Uh, these are phenomena that are not constrained just to countries that are involved in the war in Vietnam. These are actually phenomena that are uh, uh, spread across the West, uh, broadly uh, defined. And they affect Canada, they affect uh, Britain, they affect uh, France, they affect all, all of these countries that we, uh, we see as we know that weren't involved directly in the Vietnam War. So it wasn't just about the Vietnam War, but in Australia the manifestation of it was very much linked to the Vietnam War because of the, of the, of the, of the, of the issue of conscription, uh, the issue of uh, the, the uh, involvement in a war that seemed to be a war of choice. It wasn't about national survival. The contrast was very stark between uh, the generation of, of the Second World War who'd fought uh, against a foe that it clearly uh, presented an existential threat. Uh, and a foe that was really uh, a long way away in a country that people had the barest inkling of understanding about. 
Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the conflict there was, it seemed to be something that was, uh, while initially, uh, you know, the, pop, uh, the, the opinion polls were supportive of the government committing troops there, um, there was a real uh, distance to it. There was a sense that this is, this is a conflict a long way away of little relevance to Australia, and yet one that when, when the casualties started to mount, uh, really a bit in terms of policy, uh, the corrosiveness for the Australian, the, the, the Liberal Country Party government at the time. But, you know, when we think about what's happening in terms of the protest movement, uh, this, is, this is something that vexed uh, ASIO for a long time. They're wondering, you know, how, how do we understand what, what, what's actually happening here? Uh, how does the government, how did, you know, the, the Prime Minister, the ministers are all trying to figure out what to do, how, how to read this how, and, and how to respond, because they, they needed to try and get to the essence of what the issue was. And of course, the fact that there was conscription was really a, a problem. It was a fundamental problem. And you, it's what, one of those great surprises for me is that, uh, that uh, the government at the time didn't reflect more soberly on the experience of the conscription crisis of 1916 and 1917 and the enduring mm -hmm. legacy of, of, of the very toxic politics in Australia that, that had generational ramifications in terms of dividing society. Uh, you know, people uh, talk about uh, the, the intense animosity between uh, those who are supporting conscription and those who are against conscription from the First World War. Certainly the stories that I heard from my parents and grandparents um, of, of that. And, uh, and that, I think, had a legacy in terms of the divide between Catholic and Protestant in Australian society that's only, only waned in, in our lifetimes, mm. in, in mm. the last few decades. Uh, and, yet, and yet, here we go, in 1960, late 1964, uh, you know, Menzies doesn't seem to think it's all that consequential to introduce conscription. Uh, I guess uh, the sense was that, look, you know, we're not, in, we're not, uh, we're not taking out, uh, 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 we're not enlisting the whole nation. Uh, it's probably we can get away with it. Uh, and there was pressure clearly from the United States, which had conscription, uh, was doing similar things. And other countries had national service as well. Um, so there was a sense, well, maybe Australia does need to do this. And yet the, cor the terrible corrosive effect on Australian society mm. of that call uh, and the ammunition it gave to people who were already agitated about the war and about what was happening, about the Cold War itself, more broadly defined, uh, and the ammunition this gave to those people who were looking for some way of, of lashing out, um, be it from the Communist Party or from Trotskyist groups or other groups that were involved. Uh, you know, the people, you know, initially it was thought, oh, this is just a communist plot. Well, of course, as time passed, it became very evident that it was far more than just about a bunch of people who might have been associated with the Communist Party. This was about a fundamental issue in Australian society where people felt the grievance, a real grievance as to what was happening and what needed to be done. And so, you know, it was hard uh, when you look at the politics, the domestic politics of the issue, to separate that out from the kinds of issues you're seeing in Washington and, you know, in the protests in the United States and Kent State University, the, the, the protests in Paris in 1968. Why are the, why are the Parisians doing this? What, what are they thinking? You know, this is, this is, they're not involved in the conflict. They're not in, mm. they're not at Tet. They're not, they're not fighting in the streets of Saigon. What on earth mm. is going on? Mm. And it's really hard when you see the confluence of all these factors in Australian society, let alone elsewhere, to actually tease them out and in terms of a policy response for the government, work out what to do. Uh, there's this huge conundrum. Uh, we, in hindsight, can see clearly, you know, it seems so obvious to us. But at the time, when you were dealing with the crisis as it unfolded, and you're trying to read what, what the protests meant and what the, what the political ramifications of the protests were, it was really hard. Uh, and uh, a lot of people were under intense pressure to try and make sense of it and, and, and explain it to the government, because they were struggling to come to grips with it too. And, and, and the other thing is, of course, initially it didn't seem to hurt politically. In 1965, it didn't hurt politically. Uh, you know, and, and then in the next elections, they still, you know, 1969, we still managed mm. to see the Liberal Country Party coalition survive, despite all of the protests, despite the, the, the internal uh, uh, political mess that's becoming the, you know, the, the government of the time. Um, and so uh, how, much, how much emphasis was to be placed on this? It's hard to, you know, it's, it, we can see in hindsight, oh, they should have picked that earlier. 
at the time it wasn't so obvious, particularly prior to Tet in 68, February 68, that, that kind of that, mm. that, that real significant turning point where, uh, as Peter Edwards, who's here tonight, can attest, you know, it's the, the, the corrosion is great volume on, on, on uh, the nation at war, Australia, experiencing, um, you know, the, the turmoil at, domestically. That the, the, t the tipping point in terms of the, uh, the, the, the moral authority, if you like, of the government doing what it was doing in Vietnam, uh, when, uh, when, as Alan was pointing out earlier before, is the government really, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of national policy, isn't really concerned that much with what's going on in Vietnam. They're just leaving it to the, the Defence Force to worry about. It's, it's their problem, you know. They can, it's, it's, you know, it's really not something that Australians need to really understand, do they? Echoes there of some other conflict, perhaps, um, uh, but uh, you know it, it is a conundrum, a real conundrum for the government, trying to understand that and trying to then figure out what to do. And James, you described um, Nixon earlier as kind of that following the real politic mm. type approach, and often he and Kissinger are seen as as the doyens of that type of remote three D chess type approach to world politics, mm. but. There were equally very large protests in America during the time, and how did that affect the way Nixon approached kind of policy in Asia? Do you see a, an impact, a significance? Well, I mean, he, he was elected on a promise of trying to end the war um, in, uh, at the end of 68. I mean, I think, um, you know, and that took him a lot longer, which I think was very frustrating uh, for the White House. Um, I don't think he... Uh, you know, was a, was a politician who was inclined, you know, to let uh, the protest, protest movements influence his policy in any substantial way. I mean, he was just determined to push on and to try and get the peace accords signed. As I said, it took him a lot longer. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, the big protest that I think that really shocked him the most and which, I guess, worried him because it involved a lot of Europe, you know, once staunch European allies um, criticising the American government, and which, which I, I think proved for Nixon and which fed this sort of um, siege mentality that he had about a, a sort of an array of leftists, broadly defined, whether be they governments or protesters, who were out to undermine his foreign policy. But the, the biggest shock that he got, I think, was the protests at the, at the Christmas bombings mm. in 72. And, um, I mean, they were a shock in many ways to all who'd been closely observing uh, those peace negotiations because in, in October of 72, Kissinger had even said that peace was at hand. Uh, and all the trajectory uh, of those negotiations seemed to be heading in the right direction in terms of bringing an end to the conflict. But as we know, because of uh, <clears throat> the North Vietnamese and because of South Vietnamese intransigences, intransigence as well and American frustrations with their South Vietnamese ally, um, Nixon wanted to, as he put it, crack them pretty hard mm. and uh, send out a message about American credibility. I mean, that's one of the other great themes running through this period is protecting American credibility. Mm. And the protesters and these <clears throat> soft leftist governments, in his view, uh, particularly in Europe, especially the Swedish, but also, of course, Australia, are flirting with neutrality, they're, they're deserting the Western alliance, uh, they're undermining society um, at home, and, uh, uh, and, and this is something that has to be met, met with, with, with brutal force, right? Um, so, I mean, Nixon had written some very interesting articles in, um, in Reader's Digest, sort of in 67, 68. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he came to power on a law and order platform. Um, there's no doubt about that. And uh, talked a lot about rebuilding, trying to strengthen the American society and get over this period of great weakness. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's significant. But yes, it's the criticism of the Christmas bombings from coming from people like the Pope, from Gough Whitlam, from the Swedish Prime Minister, from Pompidou, um, from, uh, from the Germans as well. I mean, he's absolutely livid that at the very moment that, uh, you know, they're trying to end it, uh, that, that these, one, these allies had turned on him. And, uh, and, and that's when you get the retribution. Yeah, so... Um. And how much of the clash that you described between Whitlam and Nixon was 
based on those kind of personality factors, you know, would was it inevitable because of the strategic nature of these countries that they had to clash around this period, diverging interests, or do you see personalities as kind of having driven a lot of this concern? I don't think it was inevitable. I mean, I think, I think the differences arose primarily out of two different views, very different views of the meaning of the end of the Cold War in East Asia. I mean, but before I get to that, firstly, the clash came almost, really, was quite unfortunate for Whitlam. That is, that almost on the very day that his cabinet was sworn in was the day that Nixon ordered the Christmas bombings. And Whitlam's response initially was simply at a press conference to register his disappointment that the peace process had fallen down again. Now, had he left it at that, it would have been a very different story. But I think he was under significant pressure internally from the Labor Party, from members within his own office, that he had to deliver a more forceful response to the American administration. So you had Cairns and, and Uren and Cameron out there calling the White House maniacs and thugs and murderers, right? Um, Whitlam actually writes, in protest at the Christmas bombings, he writes a very moderate letter. But the sting is in the tail. At the end of the letter, he says, I'm going to address a joint appeal to uh, the United States and North Vietnam to return to negotiations. And moreover, I'm going to lobby other Asian nations to join me in this appeal. So immediately, the two countries, I mean, that was placing basically the United States on the same level as its communist enemy. Mm. And, uh, and, and as I show in the book, Whitlam, uh, Nixon and Kissinger were just furious, ropeable, uh, that, uh, that one of their greatest allies in the war could turn to a chief critic almost overnight. But once that died down, it then became clear that the Americans were more concerned about Whitlam going off in a different direction in Asia. For example, his support for the idea of zones of peace and neutrality, especially neutrality in the Indian Ocean. Right? Uh, this, was seen, this was seen to be basically a bit of frippery by the Americans. Uh, then he had an idea for a new kind of regional architecture that didn't involve the United States. Um, so at the very moment that the Americans are uh, are um, vulnerable because, look, they've just lost this ghastly war in Vietnam at a great cost to their blood and treasure. They're trying to recalibrate their engagement in the region. Um, and all of a sudden, and, and they see detente as something that needs careful nurturing. It's fragile. It's inherently fragile. It requires careful balancing. The Americans still see a world, Nixon still sees, sees a world of enemies, right? And they believe that Whitlam, in promoting all these ideas which, are, which don't have much substance to them, and Whitlam himself freely admits this, this idea of regional architecture, he says, well, I just want an idea that's a bit like the British Commonwealth, but in our own region, which means that we don't necessarily always pluck for a military solution to a security problem. You know, that we try and talk about it. Well, the Americans go, well, what does this mean? And why doesn't it involve us? Uh, so, here, and the Americans deliver this message time and again throughout 73, 74 and 75 and they are basically saying to the Australians, look, your great enemies in the past, or the people you were most worried about, Indonesia and Japan, that's no longer the case. Confrontation has passed. Indonesians have Sahado, everything's more or less okay there. And you're building up this fantastic, as John mentioned, this, this closer relationship with Japan, to the extent where Whitlam is talking about Japan as the new Britain for Australia. Uh, but they're also saying to the Australians, look, that's great, your, your fears are basically gone, but there's still a Cold War and there's still a climate of threat and we need to carefully maintain detente. You know, Whitlam's talking about taking an ideological holiday. That's the last thing the Americans want to hear. <laughs> and certainly this kind of language must have scared the intelligence agencies as well, John. Well, it's an interesting... Uh point. Uh, I guess the, the thing was that, uh, you know, the intelligence community, uh, which emerged from the Second World War, was very much shaped by its experience of working intimately with the United States. Uh, the architecture of what became the Australian intelligence community very much has its origins in the Second World War. In fact, the very robust nature of the very substantial bodies, uh, organisations that sit up on Russell Hill have clear and direct antecedents going back to the organisations that were part of the organisation that worked to MacArthur uh, 
uh, in, in, from 1942 onwards. Um, and so that, that, that's very much part of the DNA of the intelligence community, if you like. Uh, and that continued uh, in, uh, with, a, with a bit of an aberration in the immediate post-Second World War period when everyone's kind of trying to figure out what, what on earth to do after the Japanese have been defeated. And when before people really had come, gotten their heads around the, the Cold War having been locked in. Um, uh, we then see a whole range of organisations that, that are very much linked, you know, the, 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 the people who are founders, uh, Sir Charles Spry in, in, in Asia, for instance, you know, he's a, he's a very prominent figure, former director of military intelligence in the immediate post-war period, uh, prominent in the Second World War. Uh, the people who are uh, employed in these organisations are all experienced from, the, you know, experienced from the Second World War, intimately working alongside the United States and, and with others as well, including the Dutch, uh, uh, the British uh, and the Canadians and others. Um, so that, 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 that's the period, that's the, the nature of things uh, in, in the 1950s. And of course, in the Menzies period, that, that's consolidated. Uh, we then see that the base, uh, the, you know, the intelligence facilities, that what's now the joint facilities uh, established, Pine Gap and Narunga. This, this, you know, as Des Ball puts it, this makes us the, the suitable piece of real estate that, uh, that is the, arguably the strategic essence, becomes the strategic essence uh, of, of the significance of Australia to the United States in terms of intelligence, the intelligence relationship. This has all happened in the 50s and 60s, and it's all you know, manifested itself with the opening of Pine Gap in 1969 as the most visible and tangible manifestation of that. Uh, and of course, w when you get a new government in uh, with, with, uh, with the Whitlam government that has spent years protesting, railing against, uh, against uh, um, the, the, the engagement with the United States in Vietnam, uh, and uh, members who are seen to be sympathetic to, if not actual members of the Communist Party, uh, and uh, the grave fears that uh, James has talked about, the Nixonian view, this kind of Manichaean view of the world that is very dark. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the people who are uh, populating Australia's intelligence community in this era are people who've spent time in the United States, are very good friends in the United mm. States, are very well plugged in in the United States, who are you know patriots, but they, they have a real appreciation of just what the relationship means in terms of intelligence. Of course, that's then challenged uh, in, in the Whitlam era. And that, uh, that is certainly, uh, for some people, a scary proposition, that, that, that the basis of this relationship which, for which the engagement in the Vietnam War is in effect partly an investment in, uh, seems to be squandered very readily uh, with, with little apparent appreciation of how much stocks we've already got in this, in this uh, if you like. Um, and uh, there is real consternation th that, um, that what the Whitlam government is doing is actually uh, basically throwing away our investment. In, 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 in certainly in appearance. Now, as, as James has pointed out, Goff actually has been is quite moderate in, in his, in his in substantively. He's moderate in what he says and what he does, but he's got to deal with the rhetoric, the, the Jim Cairns school, if you like, mm. and the, the Tom Uren approach to uh, 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 using the United States as a whipping boy, um, and that presents a a, a real challenge. Uh, particularly in terms of the optics, but also in terms of the substance at the working level. People are starting to get quite worried. Um, and, uh, of course, that's a subject that I explore a little bit further in a book coming out in a month or so. so. <laughs> Watch this space, I always say. James, can I just read a, a kind of quote from your book? Mm. You say towards the end of it that... For all the abuse and insults, Whitlam ushered in a maturation process that the Australian-American alliance simply had to have, and the alliance ultimately proved strong enough to withstand it. Mm. Could you take us through what you mean by that kind of maturation process? And, and I guess to be a bit provocative, do you see echoes of that today? Um, well, yes, okay. Just let me make a couple of points there. Firstly, I'll just go back to your earlier question about Nixon and the protests. I mean, one point that should be made, a very important point, um, you know, about Nixon after that, after that election win in 68, is that from that moment, throughout 69, 70, 
1971, uh, he withdraws troops from, from Vietnam at the rate of about 100,000 a year. Mm. Now, Australia's not always consulted about that, but in many ways that takes a lot of the sting, I would say, out of the protest movement in the United States. So I'll just finish off the answer to that question before. Um, now, the maturation process. Okay. Um, I think Whitlam and the Labor Party, I mean, the, the encapsulation of this is where he says that ANZUS is not, does not in itself constitute a foreign policy for mm -hmm. Australia. It's not the be-all and end-all of Australia's foreign policy. And Keith Waller was the one who first started to use that in uh, Department of External Affairs briefs in the late 60s, by the way. Um, and, I mean, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to get at there is that you know, throughout the 1960s, in uh, crises over West New Guinea, whether or not the Indonesians were going to be allowed to annex West New Guinea, and in Indonesia's confrontation of Malaysia, the Australian government had found that the United States had a very different interpretation of the ANZUS Treaty to that held in Canberra. Mm. And the most glaring manifestation of that was when John F. Kennedy sent Garfield Barwick uh, out of the Oval Office with his tail very much between his legs, I think, at the time of the confrontation crisis, where he'd said to him, the American people have forgotten ANZUS and I can't go to Congress and ask Congress to authorise American military involvement on the ground in case of a war between yourself and Indonesia in Borneo. And Kennedy put so many conditions on American assistance that it virtually renders the agreement this, the famous Kennedy Barwick Memorandum of October 63, virtually meaningless. Now, that is not to critique in any way or criticise American policy. It, after all, is doing what any great power would do and preserve its own interests. And it sees the interest being more keeping Indonesia out of the communist camp rather than uh, committing to help Australia in, in, event, in the event of a skirmish. Um, but this message, OK, about the different interpretations of ANZUS slowly starts to make its way through the Canberra bureaucracy and the political class. Um, Paul Hasluck in 65 says, we've been put on notice by a former American president that we can't expect American protection under ANZUS. And he said, the more and more we try to spell it out in black and white, exactly what the Americans are obliged to do, the more and more they will whittle it down. Mm -hmm. And, but Hasluck's message didn't get through. So, so Holt and Gorton and McMahon all went to Washington in that period, continually asking the United States for more assurances. So much so that when Keith Waller returns from his ambassadorship, he writes to J.D.B. Miller here at the ANU and says, I was constantly embarrassed by a stream of ministers and prime ministers coming through and asking us, will answers still apply? Do you really still mean it? Will you come to our assistance? And there was a quite a, a famous instance of this where Gorton was interviewed outside Blair House in Washington and he was unable to say whether or not ANZUS applied to the area of Malaysia and Singapore when the Americans were putting great pressure on Australia to commit to the defence of Malaysia and Singapore, to recommit once the British were thinking of withdrawing. And Gorton simply couldn't answer the question. Now Whitlam, as I've said in the book, was almost Olympian in Parliament as he strolled through what he called <laughs> the debris of the conservative policy and its national security policy. He was saying, if the conservatives cannot say with any conviction what this treaty means, then we need a fresh start. We need to clear away the rubble and have a fresh start. So <clears throat> I also think the Labor Party was very frustrated at the way in which the conservatives had, had sort of put great faith in the personal relationships between president and prime minister. So obviously, the height of this was Holt and Johnson. Gorton searched for that relationship with Johnson, didn't quite get it. Um, and, and McMahon certainly didn't have it with Nixon, uh, especially once the, the disappointment about not being told about the China opening uh, filtered through. Uh, McMahon was apoplectic about that. Um, so Whitlam wanted to basically say, look, we need to treat America in the same way as we would treat relations with the French, the Germans, the Japanese. In other words, there's not a special relationship there. That's essentially what he was saying. And 
He sends a cable out. He authorises a cable. So remember, he's Minister for Foreign Affairs as well throughout the first year, as well as being Prime Minister. He sends a cable out on about the 17th or 18th of December. I don't know why I remember these dates. <laughs> but, but saying, I want you to concentrate on a more mature, less adulatory relationship with the United States. That is to be your prime message as diplomats. And that it's not simply agreement for agreement's sake, that we look at each issue on its merits. So hence some voting patterns change in the United Nations. Um, so I, I do think you know, that is probably the greatest achievement. There was a lot of turbulence and turmoil and a lot of hurt. Um, and the Americans took great umbrage at this. But in the end, they had to recognise that they couldn't take the interests of its junior ally for granted. And Marshall Green, first time the Americans in over 20 years sent a serious diplomat to Australia, a real Asian troubleshooter and a heavy hitter. Marshall Green says this in a public speech in New York in March 75 and says, publicly, frankly, the policy of all the way with LBJ was a downright embarrassment to Australia. Now, your more uh, important question, I think, as well, is you asked, does it apply to today? And what I would say there is that I think in uh, the period from 96 onwards, 1996 onwards, and you've got to remember that John Howard, as opposition leader, criticised Hawke and Keating for their minimalist approach to the alliance. This was, was a core, there was a consensus in the Australian political community, I think, during the 70s about comprehensive engagement with Asia. And whilst Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke and Keating maintained the alliance with the United States as the primary security arrangement for the nation. Nevertheless, I don't think any of them did anything to give it a more substantial content. And that's because engagement with Asia was the top policy priority. Mm. Now, as you know, Howard comes in, says Asia first, not Asia only. History, we don't have to choose between our history and geography. But I, I do think, and especially after 9-11 and right through to today, there is an increasing sentimentality about the alliance. And I think John Howard wove uh, the ANZUS Treaty and the ANZUS Alliance and the American-Australian relationship into the ANZAC legend as well. And, and once you do that, it's much harder to criticise the alliance, I think. Mm. And sentimentality, hardly needs to be said, is not a basis for policy. Now, the alliance is very much in Australia's national interest. There's no need for knee-jerk anti-Americanism, but I think there is a sense in which, at times, we have to realise there will be different national interests. We may have a different view of what is going on in Asia to the Americans. And I think what the Whitlam period shows is that memory and sentimentality can only get you so far. And one of the more interesting points out of the Whitlam period was when American diplomats said, we can't go to Canberra anymore and keep talking about the Coral Sea. It won't cut any ice in Australian domestic politics. It doesn't mean as much. Uh, so I just make that point that, that I think it's almost a shock now to sort of talk about divergent approaches between Australia and the United States in Asia. There are a lot, there's a lot on which we agree. There's a new sense of convergence in the alliance over the rise of China and what that means. That's the, the central question for our times, obviously. And we will agree, as I say, on a lot. But there needs to be scope. It's OK to disagree, right? Seems a long time since Simon Crean as Labor leader could get up in the National Parliament in 2003, welcoming President Bush here, and say that allies sometimes disagree and the alliance is strong enough to withstand it. Mm -hmm. okay. And John, can I ask you, I guess, the same question in terms of do you see echoes of the way that um, thought and changed over the alliance relationship with today or perhaps a need for greater echoes of that. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, uh, when you think about how the Alliance was viewed in the 1960s, it was really strong echoes of the 1930s in the rhetoric used. Um, the, the concern about appeasement, uh, the concern about uh, a threat that was, if it wasn't J Japan anymore, it was communism. Uh, the, the Alliance of the United States was critical to that. Uh, that fades, you know, once the Vietnam War comes to an end, uh, and there's, there's a hiatus there. Uh, and I think the, 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 the consensus that you mentioned, James, there about in the 70s between the, you know, the uh, Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Keating period, mm -hmm. I think it reflects the fact that 
there's a, a level of benign, the, the strategic environment is relatively and remarkably benign mm -hmm. for Australia. Mm -hmm. And this gets to the point you were making earlier about the United States getting frustrated with Australia not seeing it as a continuation of the Cold War. Because mm. for us it had dramatically changed. Yeah, sure. It had dramatically changed, although arguably not domestically. And I can talk about that uh, next time we meet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, th there is, there's, a, there's a, a, a strong kind of, if you like, uh, inclination to uh, do the same again for today and, 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 and use the 1930s metaphor and, and, and use the Japan, the ogre, the spectre of, of militarist Japan as, as, the, as the counterpoint to the, the, the spectre of you know, an encroaching China in the South China Sea and, and beyond. Um, I think we need to be very careful about uh, not using history uh, or not misusing history if you like, um, because while there are some easy to draw parallels, there are some very important distinctions that need to be drawn as well. Um, and uh, uh, the Japan of the 1930s was a, a brutal expansionist militarist state that was an existential threat. Mm. There's no question. Um, China today is not that by a long shot. Uh, and so we do need to think very differently about uh, what the parallels are for today and what the lessons might be for today. Uh, and there's just one point about the maturation I wanted to touch on as well. Uh, I really liked your comments, Jamie. I thought they were great. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the relationship with Britain uh, and, and the point you were making about how Britain's uh, withdrawal, from, withdrawal from east of Suez, uh, I mean, it stems back to, I think, to the, the 1956 Suez crisis. Mm. Uh, the, that kind of, when Britain really has this existential sense of, of angst about what, what on earth it can do if, if the United States is going to block them, which they did. Uh, and Australia, under Menzies, goes and tries to negotiate an agreement, and of course it fails. Uh, people poo-poo that, but of course Menzies, I think, is pretty astute on one level because he recognised that the Suez Canal was still the lifeline for Australia's trade to Europe, which at that stage was still the, the principal trade route for Australia, so it's not inconsequential. But Britain... It becomes uh, irrelevant, but interestingly, we see a, a phenomenon that, and Rick Smith would probably be able to talk to this far better than I, uh, this, this sense of Australia's foreign policy emerging. In, 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 it, it, we've got a, we have a space for mm. Australian foreign policy to emerge. Mm. And so you have the teething problems of, of, of you know, the Prime Ministers going to the United States mm. almost cup in hand, uh, you know, asking for some kind of security guarantee, and yet at the same time, there is that engagement with, with, with Southeast Asia, with Japan and Korea and China and, and elsewhere that is uh, on an unprecedented scale. Um, and while, you know, Australia had been involved in the Southeast Asian Treaty Organisation from the mid-1950s, it's really a military organisation and it's really a neo-colonial one with France and Britain and, uh, you know, the United States being the dominant players in that. The relationship with ASEAN is a completely different one. ASEAN is homegrown. Um, it's initially the, the non-communist five countries. It expands eventually to include the whole of Southeast Asia. Uh, our engagement with them, with Japan, uh, with Indonesia, once Suharto gets into office, these are, these are of enduring consequence. Uh, and Australia's experience at finding its way in that time, in that space, um, is, uh, merits considerable re-examination to learn some more lessons as we think about the future and the rise of Asia. Yeah, just a final point. Um, <clears throat> uh, when you think about in the mid-60s when, I can't remember who it is in external affairs, but it's after the East of Suez decision, and I think they're still sort of trying to work out what it all means, but one of the briefs says, well, we're, we're out of Europe, we're out of the Atlantic, and we're out of Asia. And... So there's that sort of sense of a, of a void and, and, uh, and, and how we're going to answer this great strategic question. Um, and I think when you put that, when you put that as, as your marker, then to see where the country is at the end of the 70s, um, I think there is, this, there is this remarkable transformation because in the mid-1960s you are still, in essence, uh, this country is defining itself as white and British. And from 65... 66 through to 72, 73, you have the progressive dismantling of the white Australia policy. Um, and then both governments build, as you say, John, 
on those earlier links with, with Southeast Asia and especially with Japan. I mean, the Commerce Treaty is remarkable when you mm. think it's only 12 years after the end of the Second World War. Um, and, and I mean, I, I would also say don't forget Malcolm Fraser as well. I mean, it's not all about Gough Whitlam in this period. I mean, the, the statement which I think is remarkable <clears throat> that Malcolm Fraser makes when he is asked in 76, oh, why are you going to Tokyo and uh, uh, Beijing first as Prime Minister, not to London and Washington? And he simply says, the world changes. Right? And he is the one who I think in many ways puts more flesh onto the bones of the multicultural ideal. Mm. Um, he continues Whitlam's work on Japan. That's when the, the Nara Treaty is signed. He continues um, to develop Australia's China policy, albeit with a very different edge to it. It's more realpolitik. It's what, you know, what China can do in terms of keeping Soviet ambitions at bay. It's not the way Whitlam was using China, which was the sort of epitome of Australia's new embrace of Asia in the region. Um, so, and, and Fraser too was saying uh, our policies with the United States will not always necessarily be identical. So in many ways Whitlam continues a lot of the <coughs> changes that, uh, uh, Fraser continues a lot of the changes that, that Whitlam brings in. So I think it's an extraordinary period of creative diplomacy, transformation, and that sets the stage for I guess that period, I think arguably one of Australian foreign policy's most successful periods, mm. and that is the 1980s. In terms of, of trying to find its place in the region, uh, the 1980s, I think, uh, is very, very significant.